What's going on, everybody? Welcome to the Alex Cuesta Show. I'm really happy you are here on this Sunday, December 18th of 2022. For any astute listeners, you will know that this is much later than we record. And there's a reason. For once, it's not because me and David fucked up and got really lazy, because usually that's why. <laughs> we get lazy, we do something stupid, we didn't feel like recording, days and days and days, oh, finally, let's make a show. No, this one is a special reasoning, and we'll get to that before we do. Like, share, follow, subscribe, rate us five stars, Spotify and iTunes, spread this word of mouth. Go find us on the socials at the Alex Cuesta show. Dave, do you have anything to say that's usually of non importance before we get going? No, no, actually, I do not. Not this time, at least. <laughs> so the reason why today's special, because we have our first ever guest from across the pond and from anyone that knows kind of logistically getting that together, you have to know the difference in time zones and I sure as hell don't. Google machine, (laughs) as terrible as Google is as an organization, doing things like trying to figure out like, so what is it if it's this time here in New York and it's there over in, you know, Great Britain, like whatever it is, it helped us out here because we were able to organize this and we are pumped to have Lord Miles Routledge on the show. Did I say your last name correct? Oh, absolutely. Yes. Most people don't. You got it spot on, mate. Thank you so much for having me on. (laughs) I got lucky. I got lucky. And I will say listening to your interview with Callum definitely helped there. I cheated. I cheated 100 percent because you talked about how you announced your name there. So I'm not going to take any of the credit. So, Lord Miles, first, tell us about yourself. Who are you? Because I usually give a synopsis, but you're a freaking badass dude. So tell me about yourself a little bit. Thank you. Um, Firstly, in summary, I guess I'm retarded, but in a good way uh, that people like to see. <laughs> so I go to the most dangerous place in the world, and uh, just for fun, really, for a holiday. So I was most well known originally during the fall of Kabul. So I went there genuinely for, for a holiday in Afghanistan. Then the Taliban took over the country. I was stuck there and I started taking pictures with the SAS soldiers and also the Taliban special forces goofing off. Went to the front lines of Ukraine. I'm um, going to Ukraine in a few days again. I'm also, uh, I went to South Sudan. I went to the protests in Kazakhstan by sneaking into the country. I've broken every single immigration law in Schengen, jumped multiple borders, got banned from Schengen <laughs> and a million other things. Uh, and I will not stop and one day they will find me and put me in prison. <laughs> so most recently I saw on uh, Twitter just for fun, you spent four hours in Spain just because you weren't allowed to. Uh, you had a minor yes. change in your passport and apparently the EU is not good with minor changes since everything's done by robots. They're just like, oh, this isn't the same passport. Let's let him go. So that was fantastic. So one thing about you is, you know, I was thinking about it and I'm like, what am I going to say about Miles? Because obviously he's done some badass things. But what I found is you're kind of the guy as most guys growing up. And I guess, you know, I have to say the, the equivalency, some women too. No, fuck that. Most guys growing up kind of always dream about, you know, being that great explorer, right? Like we want to be firemen. We want to be policemen. We want to, you know, save a hot girl from a burning building and then, you know, have a sweeper away and things happen. But those all happen. But another thing is, we want to sit there and just be that adventurer and just go on and say, screw it. I'm going to go to dangerous places and I'm going to live my life and have adrenaline rushes. But a lot of us are pansies. A lot of us don't have the balls to do it. We settle down. We have families. We have jobs we don't want to lose. But then comes along a dude like you and it's like, all right, let's live vicariously through this guy now. Like, <laughs> How does it feel like you're kind of doing what a lot of people well, especially dudes kind of maybe not now because there's a bunch of soy boys but dudes back in the day wanted to do where it's like that place has bombs going off let me just go walk through it for fun <laughs> like that's what you're doing it's insane <laughs> oh no i haven't been to detroit not joking. <laughs> <laughs> no one should go to detroit <laughs> oh exactly i do have my limits yeah some people <laughs> go to me and go wow it's crazy what you're doing you're really living free it's it's amazing uh you know you have the courage to do this stuff and I just got so sweating internally. My brain just shouts, wow, they're just saying you don't have common sense. <laughs> <laughs> but taking it as courage, not like some retardation or something. <laughs> I don't think I've got a sense of self-preservation, but at the same time, I've really grown into the role. I, I recall going to South Sudan and it was straight after um, it was straight after the Taliban takeover. I had all that backing and support from the people online. And I was like sweating in my seat thinking, I'm about to land in this crap old nation um, and explore it. I really don't know what I'm doing. I can't believe I've jumped down this rabbit hole. And now it's like, oh yeah, I almost got shot again. Uh, Yeah. (laughs) I I think, I think I've just, 
I don't know, mentally fortify myself into the character that I want to be. Yeah. Um, I just really LARPed, basically, and it worked. <laughs> Yeah, and I feel like you do have this certain type of charisma that just seems to work on a lot of people. Like the story that you have of when the Taliban like saw you and then you told them, wait, wait, I'm from Wales. We hate the English too. <laughs> they're like, that's One cool. struggle. Yeah. One struggle. Yeah, and they're like, oh, they were like, okay, that's cool. You can go. <laughs> like, I don't know. I like the story even better. Hold on, Dave. When you're too tired to give a shit and you're just walking across the, cav- the caravan of Taliban, going to take Kabul airport, and you just thumbs up them like, yeah, man, yeah. I'm going across. Leave me alone. And then the guys in the back, you thumbs down them. And they just all laugh at you. They like <laughs> Yeah, they're just looking at me like this goofy white boy. We can just shoot him right now. Uh, but he, he has a very cute smile. And the others were like, wow, this guy here gave us a thumbs down that takes balls. Like, <laughs> gotta go respect it. Because I don't know, it feels like, it feels like I delayed the Taliban advancement and takeover of Kabul airport for like five seconds. You did more uh, than the Biden administration. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, I think they made it happen in the first place. You know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it, it was a it was a big thrill, and I went back a few months later mm-hmm. and just saw the Taliban and met them and shook their hands and took a few selfies. You know, those those guys are all right. I've got to admit, they're not too bad. Not too bad. I'm sorry, Dave. I jumped into your thought. Finish your thought. I'll no, no, there. it's fine. That was basically it. It's just like a, <laughs> a, 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 a distinct sort of charisma, and just I don't even know if it's quick thinking or you're just throwing whatever you want out there, but. It, it it seems to work on a lot of people for a specific reason because you're you're not showing that you're a threat you're, like you're showing that you just you're just out there like you're just exploring you're not trying to do anything like thank you no I feel like if you give some people some respect and you make a very odd joke mm-hmm. you give them a nice smile mm-hmm. sometimes you play on some of their wording and stuff reflect yeah. it back upon them because if it's yeah. a life and death situation you could be a little bit you could be a little bit cheeky and mm-hmm. pull some strings I guess. Mm-hmm. But it really does work. Or maybe maybe I just like have a nice small. I'm not too sure. <laughs> <laughs> so you have a book out, uh, Lord Miles in Afghanistan. It kind of talks about your first time going, you know, into Afghanistan, into Taliban territory and to do, you know, and you have it right there <laughs> and to, you know, kind of talk about all your things that went on there. Give us a general synopsis of the book. And you mentioned, you know, Afghanistan and Taliban a few times kind of go into, you know, your adventures going in there. I know I, um, you went back with Callum, right? He went back with you and that was, uh, you know, trials and tribulations going on there. Talk about the synopsis of your book and how you feel about, you know, Afghanistan, the people, Taliban. Give us a little bit of a rundown there. Thank you. Yeah. So the opening of my book is me describing the COVID situation that we're all too familiar with. Mm -hmm. Every country for about one year was closed down. You couldn't go on holiday. And of course, I really wanted to go on holiday. And the only country that was open up without any COVID restrictions, without a vaccine mandate, was Afghanistan. So it talks through my (laughs) genius logic of just wanting to go on a hard day just to screw over the system. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. And then I decided, oh, let's go to the embassy. Um, And of course, the embassy just laughs at me. Mm -hmm. Um, But, you know, somehow I pull my strings, get a visa for Afghanistan. I talk through the thought process, uh, the flights, why it's actually like getting there, uh, what the Taliban were like um, in rumor before it actually went down Mm -hmm. and just, General, generally what it was like in Afghanistan a few days before the takeover. He even has pictures. That's good for me because I can't that read works, yeah. or write, apparently. <laughs> Everyone <laughs> likes a picture book. Everyone so likes true. a picture book. Yeah, they, they won't let me do a pop-up book. So uh, annoying. <laughs> yeah, it's like Taliban boot. With the, with the felt with the grenade, A real grenade flies out the first time you open it. <laughs> <laughs> just give your grandfather PTSD or something. <laughs> <laughs> and it just talks about um, my my tour guide, uh, what I saw there, and then the takeover of Kabul, how it was actually notified the average person, um, and from there, basically, and how I posted everything on 4chan, and just the small details that the media got wrong. Actually, the big details, because the media always lies. I think we yeah, know that. Yes. Yep. Apart from this podcast, this is the good media. Uh, <laughs> and then, Thank you. <laughs> and it just shows me getting goofier and goofier with, with photo evidence. Um, <laughs> And eventually concludes saying, oh, yeah, Miles got out of Afghanistan somehow. Um, but also he went back for some reason and met the Taliban. Here's a selfie with them. Maybe <laughs> another book one day. The end. Yeah. <laughs> that works. So do you think that part of it plays in? Because you talk about how, like, you know, David mentioned your charisma and everything. 
do you think at points like, uh, you know, you mentioned a lot um, in a lot of ways, like, you know, when you're going to these types of places, you know, in a serious note, you go to these types of places, you're going yes. to deal with people because you're acknowledging that, you know, the people of the Taliban, you know, all these, they have different, they have um, kind of stigmas on them. But in the end, you believe that they're still just people. Does part of this go in? Do you think some of them are just thinking this guy's absolutely insane? And, you know, he's willing to come here like he knows we hate Westerners. He knows. But he's just walking in here uh, like just fine. Like like nobody's business. Like he owns a country. Do you think part of that has to play with it? Like they kind of, you know, you don't look like a violent dude. You look fairly unassuming. You've sent me some pictures with you in an AK. I would feel like it might blow your shoulder off. Like you don't look like a big dude. Like neither am I, but you you look a lot less threatening. I think than I do. I think people would walk to the other side of the street when they see me with you, they're going to ask you for $5. Like you look like a really nice guy. Um, But do you think someone that goes, they're looking at you going, this guy's nuts. I just don't even want to test him. Like I have the suicide vest on, but I feel like he'd pull it for me. Like (laughs) you think part of that is uh, kind of what goes in there thinking and why you get away with things. People might just think you're a little crazy. I think so, yeah. Sometimes you got to be a little bit whimsical and harmless, mm-hmm. and people just kind of like that. I feel like a capybara to some degree, right? <laughs> <Are> you, <laughs> I don't know. If, I think if the Taliban have just gone through 20 years of war and the guy has seen, you know, 50 of his men just die or yeah. something and he's the only one left, and I just waltz up reminding him of the man who bombed his brother or something and just start shaking his hand forcefully just smiling at him and asking him to sign my book or something <laughs> <laughs> you know i don't think they can say no i, I think it's just sheer confidence sometimes that really does work <laughs> you could just walk up to anyone besides isis which i do plan to do if i'm running to them again yeah. and just just start speaking to them and i guess they're just like wow this isn't gonna happen again i might as well roll with this why not <laughs> we haven't got any reason to kill him just yet maybe he'll <laughs> give us a chance <laughs> So on Twitter, you were recently just added to the infidels that are all right uh, group <laughs> by uh, by members of the Taliban, which is pretty insane. Um, yeah. That's a compliment. That's an that achievement is a, right there. That's a huge compliment from, you know, people who are very, you know, very tight knit. I feel like there might be like 16 people probably in that group of infidels who are all right. <laughs> but... <laughs> Um, you know, talk about talk about how you feel about Afghanistan because you know you speak about them. I feel like many Westerners, what we know about the Middle East, what we know about Afghanistan, especially people you know mine and David's age, um, is nine eleven is going through the war on terror for most of our lives is seeing a lot of strife and things that go on there. And you know, me, I'm a history major, so I know a lot of the issues in the Middle East is Western caused, but at the same time, there's a lot of danger going on there. Um. Talk about Afghanistan a little. What do you feel? Do they get a bad rap in the West because of all we know about is wars that have went on, especially with between Britain and America and other things going on in the Middle East? Um, talk about it a little. How do you feel about them? Yeah, so I feel like when most people hear the word Afghanistan, they just go, oh, and then, you know, just back off from there. But it used to be a really popular song. Uh, someone overheard that. <laughs> uh, it used to be a really popular tourism country in the 1970s before everything went down to poo. Mm-hmm. Um, but now, a days, I think it's going to regain that. So, oh, sorry. I'm in a hotel and some people are being weird. Yeah. It's, I think, it, <laughs> I I think I'm in a crack time. house, guys. <laughs> yeah. oh, no. you, you, who, who knows? Who, where, in, where in the United States is Lord Miles? That should be like, <laughs> not where in time is Carmen San Diego? Where, which, de- which death trap is Lord Miles in today? That should be the game we play. <laughs> so true. But honestly, so w- when you meet the Taliban, most of the time they're just guys that uh, on too deep into the whole philosophy of the war. They just go, oh, foreigners came to our land. We fought them off. We won. Hooray. Yeah. Um, and I think the whole thing that happened with 9-11 was linked back more to Saudi. And then also a bit of fled to Afghanistan mm-hmm. just because he knew no one could find them. Mm-hmm. And no one really understood who he was. So he was able to get around there. I mean, he yep. fled to Pakistan, but no one realized it. So it was just mm-hmm. kind of a really tough thing to keep a track of as an American. And you yeah. just think, oh, we have made Afghanistan should be really bad. You know, it's not a perfect country. Um, the Taliban went from really, really terrible people 40 something years ago where they would execute you if your pubic hair wasn't long enough when they randomly <laughs> measured it. Uh, and if you listen to the radio, 
uh, they would just straight up uh, kill you. Yeah, but nowadays, yeah. they're on TikTok just goofing off. So <laughs> I, that's why. You know, I think I think in forty years, you know, they've basically had the civil rights equivalent uh, of a movement that went mm-hmm. on. They've just done some really good stuff, and they, they would be really kind if you talk to them and just ask them to sign a book or just you know take a selfie or something they're usually just bros like it's just lads that are trying to goof off like all of us really at the end of the day you know it's got to be bizarre to hear like it is bizarre to hear just like coming from here from a person who you know i, I try not to judge many people but it is tough being you know being over here in america in new york and it's like you know, we kind of all like ah, suck it until proven otherwise. Like that's kind of <laughs> how I feel. Where you go into a completely different of like, you know, I'm gonna think that you're a decent person until proven otherwise. Now you are a very religious individual. You are a devout Catholic, right? Am I correct? Oh yes, man. You're a devout Catholic, and um, that has a lot to play with your worldview. And it, you know, there's a difference between being a practicing devout Catholic and just being a Catholic. Like your worldview is legitimate Catholicism of, you know, turn the other cheek, love thy neighbor, and you're actually practicing and preaching it when you're going into these areas and when you're going and doing these types of things. So. Uh, does being religious, does having kind of the mission in your heart of trying to spread good go into why you want to go into all these war-torn and dangerous places and kind of spread, just not spread the word of God, but just spread happiness and goodness? I think so, yeah. So when I go to these places, I always have a charitable aspect where I'll give some money away if I've got some spare. So I, I haven't profited from these travels so far. I've always broken even, which is intentional. and I, I just That's amazing. <laughs> Thank you. And I just give away the money uh, to some degree to some nice people on the street. You know, you see a child and you give them a bucket of KFC equivalent in Afghanistan and their, their, their face lights up. It's amazing yeah. to see. So yeah. I'm like, well, you know, if, if I can do a little bit of good in these places, why not? You know, no one else mm-hmm. is going to. Mm-hmm. I'm not going to trust the UN or the World yeah. Food Program to do yeah. anything. You know, might as well do it through the word Honestly, of God. You'd probably do more than them at this point. Yeah. <laughs> It'll net good. Yeah. And I do have a weird story to tell. So when when I rocked up to the Taliban, I got dared to basically say shalom to them. Uh, so I went one step further and said shalom, my niggers. And they, <laughs> <laughs> and they, they looked at me and actually smiled. And they think they I misunderstood like how to pronounce summer leak on. And I didn't understand my niggers bit, but you know what? So I, I just rolled a bit. I should have filmed oh I'm going to do it again next time I go back. Oh. But I was like, you know, shalom, my niggers my tally bros you know oh, and they were like oh hello sir you know they were just shaking my hands really oh, chill my God. and they were like they were like oh are you muslim i was like no no i'm catholic and they were like oh cringe they didn't say cringe but yeah, <laughs> yeah, they, yeah. they were thinking yes yeah. yeah yeah and i was like oh you love uh jesus too as well because he's a prophet in their religion mm-hmm. so we kind yes. of bonded over that mutual understanding of jesus mm-hmm. i was like yeah he's a good dude isn't he and they're like yeah he's good <laughs> so, <laughs> so we found some common ground there and they they respect mary too she's the only woman mentioned in the quran apparently so yep. i was like oh, the highest woman in the Ma- religion. exactly yeah so i was like about mary chick pretty <laughs> lovely isn't she they're like yeah 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 <laughs> But we did all form one, I think. Uh, they, they kind of started smiling around then. Mm-hmm. And then now I'm added to one of their group chats. They're quite lovely. So, you know, I was actually going to ask you that because I know a little bit about, you know, the religion of Islam. And I think Islam gets a very bad rap because a lot of the places are living by one part of the Quran, uh, the Muhammad, the warrior, which has the Sharia law aspect in it. And, you know, they're not living by the rest of the Quran, which, you know, is obviously a problem because Muhammad the warrior is very violent, very, you know, it's not a good part, but the Quran is not all that. And you mentioned how Jesus is essentially number two in their whole entire religion. You know, Muhammad's the highest, but Jesus is basically the second highest prophet. He's just not Muhammad. And Mary is the only woman and the highest woman in their religion. And I feel like a lot of people don't understand that. And you coming in with that understanding I feel like it's something that is very disarming. And I think that a lot more people need to, and especially Christians. And I think this is, you know, a lot of disservice done by Christian pastors and Christian priests where they don't kind of talk about this type of stuff to people um, to kind of disarm them. But uh, did did you, so you talked about making that connection. Is that something that you try to do um, when you come in with any 
you know, anyone that seems like hostile in the Middle East, do you try and come in with that connection of like, hey, we both believe in this, even though I'm a Christian, I'm not going to knock your faith. I understand you where you put Muhammad, but we both still like this and we both like that. Let's connect here type of deal. Kind of, yeah. There's a certain way to go about it. You kind mm -hmm. of stand there with your hands in your pockets and you just go, hmm, this Godfellow, pretty lovely, isn't he? <laughs> and they'll go, they'll basically go, yeah. It's like yeah. you're mentioning the weather. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And then, and then every once in a while, you just say inshallah, which means God willing. You mm -hmm. do the little finger thing. Yeah. They love to see that. You know, you do waving with your finger. Okay. Uh, and you say your three phrases, and they're like, wow, this white dude's all right. And then you can start dropping kind of the uh, truth bombs about Mary and Christ and everything. Mm -hmm. And then it gets to a point where they just say, so true. And they just roll with it. But if you just straight up go out and say, like, oh, Jesus, we have something in common because of Jesus, they'll kind of think you're trying to subvert them a little yeah. bit. You know what I mean? Yeah. You're yep, kind yep. of going up. Yeah. But if you mm -hmm. just chill with them, they're more than fine. So do you feel like they're a little open-minded? Like, you know, you made the joke about not coming to Detroit. And, you know, I don't recommend going to Detroit, Chicago, anything like that, or even part of New York City anytime soon, because I feel like it would probably be harder in current America to connect with some very tribalistic, some very politically grounded people that believe some really not true stuff uh, going on in those countries that we, you know, in those cities that have resorted to violence in America. But have you kind of considered maybe coming to any of these places and seeing if what you do would work if you walk through, you know, Compton, California, where the Crips and Bloods are still big and kind of walked up with one of them and kind of tried talking to him. Like, have you considered that? Or do you think your life would be more on the line there than over in the Middle East? I would honestly say it's more dangerous in California or uh, Detroit <laughs> or some parts of Florida than it actually is in Afghanistan. Like in Afghanistan, I know I'm never going to get milked or I'm never going to have to pay a bribe or no one's going to stab me. But at the same time, if I go to London, the West Coast, East Coast or whatever... It's going to be proper dodgy. You know, I, I just don't trust it at the end of the day. You go you go to uh, California, uh, they're going to stab you. You go become homeless within a week. Uh, you know, yeah, you, 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 they, they give you gay pills. I don't know. That's what happens in California. <laughs> <laughs> it's just... <laughs> You'd have to poop on the street to prove you're one of them in yeah, San Francisco. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen the oh. poop map. I hope it just gets added instantly, you know? Yeah, just say no. <laughs> that's mine. That's mine. That's mine yeah. right there. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Little picture submission you got to send in, you know? <laughs> you with your face smile and thumbs up. <laughs> so as you're doing all this type of stuff, are you getting pressure from the British government, American government, NATO, um, the UN to stop doing this type of stuff? Like, are you getting contact saying, hey, you're kind of screwing up what we kind of do as a face of a charity to help these people. Like you're making us look irrelevant. Like we actually are. Stop it. Like, are you getting in contact with many people telling you to stop doing what you're doing? Oh yeah. The journalists, mostly the journalists. So mm -hmm. the UK government, the only thing they did was, uh, Actually, no, they did two things. One thing is uh, when my second trip was about to happen, they uh, they took me in the interview room. I was at the airport. They arrested me at the airport, took me <laughs> to an interview room, took my phone, cloned my data, oh took my DNA God. swabs from my mouth and my cheek and everything, and asked me if I was a terrorist, if I'm going to do some dodgy stuff in South Sudan. I was there like, oh, I'm going on a goofy holiday. They were like, oh, you're, <laughs> you, you're Islamic extremist. I was like, oh, I don't have a beard, my dudes. You know, kind of retarded <laughs> right there. <laughs> yeah. I, I called the woman a diversity hire. You know, I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> but uh, she was, though. I mean, I've got to admit, she couldn't even find like the money I smuggled in my bag. <laughs> like, I was trying incredible. to hide it. I was trying to hide it from like, you know, anyone that was going to mug me. And they couldn't find it. I'm like, you know, are you stupid? Uh, <laughs> so, you know, I don't think the UK government's too much of a risk to me, unless if I continue not paying my taxes, wink, wink. Yeah. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the only other time, too, I, I recall bringing back about, uh, what was it, 40 kilograms of, uh, of um, what's it called, Taliban merch, which is, I mm -hmm. think it's like 100, 100 pounds, that is, 100 pounds in America. So I brought back like three or four suitcases of Taliban merch, 
and then I laid it on the customs table and told them, oh, do I need to pay import fees? And they were, they were just pressing this red button under yeah. the... Uh, someone, someone, come yeah. check this guy out. Yeah. Again, yeah. Again, it was some woman just going, oh, you, you should have brought this. It's terrible. I'm like, it's illegal, though. She's like, no, you can bring it in. <laughs> uh, but we're going to visit your house to inspect it because this is really dodgy. Expect to knock at your door. Uh, no joke, we will be at your house within like a few days. They never came. I just, <laughs> I even called up, I even called up the police asking them to raid my house. They never did. It's kind of, <laughs> it's kind of insulting that I'm not even a high level terrorist for them. Just, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You guys come in like I made it yeah. extra clean. I was ready for it. <laughs> yeah, literally. Yeah, I was I was on high alert for two weeks. I was cleaning my room. I was like looking out the windows. Like I was advice waiting for guests. I even yeah. baked you don't want to be a shameful them. host. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I kind of wanted to go like, hey guys, look, I'm really organized. Maybe I can work for you guys. Ah, ha, ha. But don't they miss the opportunity? Um, the main thing is like the journalists. They will write articles about me, just saying, oh. Uh, you know, they don't use my name. That's a funny thing too. They, they, they are told to use the word Lord Miles, but they say crazy British man or crazy Brit tourist or balmy tourist. Wow. Yeah, and I'm like, no wonder if they're not trying to use my name. No one knows your name because you're nobody journalist. That is true. Uh, yeah, exactly. They're one of these diversity hires again. It's like when I went to South Sudan for the third time, when I when I popped in, um, I went to this little social event of this new restaurant opening. Mm-hmm. And then I saw this one lady, she was a journalist, uh, you know, from England, you know, mm-hmm. she was white. And I was like, well, there's no white people here. I'm also speak to her. So we started speaking a little bit and she finds out who I am. She looks disgusted <laughs> and she turns, she turns, she turns and she's like, you shouldn't fucking be here, you know? And then she, then she turns again and goes, oh, it's nice meeting you. Bye. And I'm just laughing and I, I search her up at the end because I got her name. I search her up and she's the one that wrote three bad articles about me just oh slandering me. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I just started laughing at it. And I sent her an email like a week later because she had a she had a grammatical error uh, mm. within one of the articles because they're pumped out within like half an hour yeah. to get the first one. So I just sent her like a list of the uh, issues she had <laughs> like in an article. She never responded back, I think. Doing but, more yeah. work than her editor. <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> Are, so are, have you been contacted by any of these big um, leftist, uh, I don't call them corporate or mainstream, I call them leftist media, any of these big leftist media organizations to do interviews? And if you have, is your goal just to shit post basically the whole interview <laughs> and just like make it one big meme? Or would you actually try to give them a real interview, which I think is always a mistake because they're going to mischaracterize you anyway? Yes, I think the biggest leftist media that I've reached out is the Israeli military unofficially. So I've had I've had members of the Israeli yeah, military reach out uh, saying like, "Oh, you should go to uh, you should come to uh, what's it called um, what's what's that one area that's in dispute within Israel? Oh, the Gaza um, Strip. Gaza? Yeah, the Gaza Strip. They were like, we can take you to Gaza, like the front lines, you know, yeah. like with most dangerous stuff is. We'll give mm-hmm. you like body armor and stuff. I, I, I backed out of the last second because it seemed too good to be true. I don't know why yeah. they were trying to hook me up with that. Yeah. And I think it was just an excuse to do a false flag to shoot me. That's my honest theory. Like the guy was very kind, no hate to him. I just don't trust like when someone gives me a too easy to do yeah. adventure like that. It just felt really dishonest. Like I've got some Israeli contacts that so are proper solid. They're good people at the end of the day. You know, like medics and people that work in uh, uh, think tanks. Like they've addicted to Ukraine happening to the day somehow. And, you know, I want to keep those in my circle. But the guy just saying, yeah, we'll take you to Gaza. Like, you know, and you have to pay us a single thing. We'll cover all the costs. I'm like, oof. Yeah. I wonder why. A little bit too yeah, you hear, true. You hear that? A little bit too Ed? spooky. Yeah. Lord Miles only puts himself in death situations. You don't do it for him. He's the only exactly. person allowed to put himself in near death yeah. situations, damn it. Exactly. If a country if the if the feds collapse a country around me as not organic, I'm just gonna yell LARP in the Oval Office or something. <laughs> So you talk about you've been to Ukraine, you go to all these types of places. What has been the most, uh, you know, kind of dodgy situation you've been in so far? Um, Because you talk, you know, when I listen to your interview and I've seen some things, you talked a few times where you're like, yeah, I'm dead here. What has been a situation uh, where you're like, absolutely like there is, you know, this was a good run. Thank you, God, getting out of here. It was fun by civilization. Like what, what was that situation? Oh yeah, this is this is a very clear one in my head. 
So I'm trying to start an Afghan gold mine in the long term. Uh, so within one year, I'm going to be setting up a real operation, like you know, Af- African child mine style. I'm joking. <laughs> but it's it's you know, it's going to be like me and like twenty locals plus my best friends plus some armed guards and stuff. You know, starting up a proper gold mine, ship it yeah, to Pakistan, and so on. So I drove about 16 hours on the way to Kandahar from Kabul. And if you look at the map, it's pretty much like a quarter across Afghanistan and it was the most dodgy roads. So we started mm-hmm. at 6 a.m. We got there around, I think it was like, I think it was like something like way beyond midday. Yeah. And when we got there, they initially hadn't seen a foreigner since uh, the last two years because no one's dared being, mm-hmm. being there. Yeah. So we were all just staring at me even though I was in local clothes I wasn't saying any English words. Mm-hmm. I greeted them. They were very kind to me but everyone was kind of looking at me like yeah, yeah. what's this guy doing here? <laughs> and I point for mountain but I want to mine because I know exactly what I'm looking for because reasons um, <laughs> and I go to this small really small village that's basically just some uh, made of mud huts you know it's it's really really old-fashioned it, it's cool it's just mm-hmm. really backwards you know yeah and we go up to them and i go hey i'm interested in mining this area here i might be buying mining rights and i want to uh sample some of your soil if you wouldn't mind i'll happily pay for some stuff for you guys for the privilege and they go yeah we know we know we got gold here you know we, we can't mine it so it'd be really good to have someone who can help us mine it mm-hmm. and we get cut so i'm like yeah it sounds more than absolutely fine and then some guys start approaching us and it becomes quite dodgy so they're, they're staring us down there's some big lads mm-hmm. and not part of the village and then they they bag my head with like a black bag like a pillow bag like like a movie and, scene, like yeah, like a, like a proper movie scene, and that was actually the first thing that went through my head. It wasn't, oh, I'd be bagged. I'm like, wow, it's like the movies. <laughs> <laughs> I know what Tom Cruise That's feels like now. Mission yeah. Impossible. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm Bond. Yeah. I'm James Bond. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then I felt something cold be pressed against my forehead. And then it, then it clicked to me. Oh crap! This isn't like some sort of joke or something. I really am in that in Afghanistan with a barrel of a gun pointed to my head. Gosh. And I heard like some so I heard like nothing for a while, some silence. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, I'm very dead or something. I'm just gonna realize this, uh, whatever. And then I heard some talking and then some shouting and some more talking and so on. And then it went silent. And then the bag came off and I was like, you know, starting to breathe again. The dust was kicked out of the bag. It was a really old bag. So I was like, <laughs> coughing. Yeah. And they were like, oh, sorry, we thought you were someone else. There's this guy who came here like a few years ago looking to invest. Um, and he screwed over some people. Uh, and he, he he fit your description. We don't see many white people. We'd have a photo of him. Really mm-hmm. sorry. There's been mm-hmm. a mix up. And I was like, oh, that's cool. And I, I kind of just <laughs> get, I get off. I get up from my knees and they saw like they saw like getting a uh, cloth and wiping down my knees like mm-hmm. dirt from my clothes for me and like shaking my hand and they're just being really kind i'm like you guys you shouldn't have <laughs> <laughs> yeah and it got to the point where i was like you know what i always got shot for being someone else but i wasn't um bit dodgy but those people are quite nice now and once again i have been one of group chats because the guy grows uh, grapes and they're very lovely to eat and i might order from him again so in your eyes is what you're doing kind of showing and proving that like the whole entire charity situation or at least 99 percent of it is just bullshit and all the people that are bleeding hearts that are saying oh give to this place give to that one and that have the money or have the invoice to go down and do what you do on a bigger scale uh does it kind of sit there in your eyes and go man everyone's full of shit Everyone that has this whole entire thing, or do you feel like your ability to kind of fly under the radar helps you do what you do? Yeah, I generally think most of the charities are full of nonsense, right? So you go there and you have a look around and you, you, so for example, there was this one camp, it's called Kukuma Refugee Camp in Northern Kenya. Mm -hmm. I've been there twice now and it's been operating since the late nineties where it has roughly 200,000 residents and receives like something like 20 million in funding every single year and has mm-hmm. done since you know, the same day it was founded. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, wow, this must be a, a place of hope and prosperity and you know, future development. And you walk around, there's not a single paved road. Everyone lives in mud huts still, corrugated iron, no electricity beyond certain hours. If you're hooked up to the electricity grid, which only 5% are. I'm a policeman on a salary of 
I think it was like $140 a month equivalent, oh uh, get like these massive new build houses um, somehow. You know, it's just, it's just all corruption. This money goes mm-hmm. nowhere mm-hmm. and it goes to some some person's pockets who managed to pull some strings, you know, some manipulators, those types. Mm-hmm. Um, and you, you can take like 10 minutes looking around and you can realize that something is wrong. But as soon as you bring it up, man, like people come down upon you because then they realize they'll lose all that money themselves. Mm -hmm. So it will just stop you from saying anything. I mean, I said it anyway because I don't care, but, (laughs) you know, there's no real journalists out there. It would take like, honestly, a few hours just to go there with a dedicated team and a hidden Mm -hmm. camera and expose Mm -hmm. some stuff. And then you start going around and you realize it's the same. So either you've got charity work that keeps people you know, on their feet, like, oh, some food, which is quite nice. Like the Taliban give away food. I've seen that. Um, maybe some clothes, maybe vacation or hotel stay for the night or whatever. But there's no real charities that actually build up people because there's too much corruption and people just don't know what they uh, know. I mean, some charities just think if you give an African, like, uh, an iPad and uh, a PDF tutorial on how to um, program in JavaScript, they'll be, you know, doing coding classes in like five years time it's just it's not realistic i think most of it retarded (laughs) yeah yeah i remember it was a it was a bit ago it might have been that camp where you were talking about on twitter like you were basically exposing that the un it was like this this guy i can't exactly remember but this guy needed something he had requested something from the un or from one of these places and it's been like years and they could have gotten to him in, in like an hour <laughs> and you got it for him. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's just embarrassing. Oh, exactly. Yeah. It's really simple. It's just some glasses. That's all we need. Yes. Yes. Thank yeah. You. Glasses. Yeah, exactly. I, well, I mean, like in Canada, really... they would just say, hey, you want to commit suicide instead of getting glasses? Because <laughs> yes. that's, you know, can, in Canada's uh, medical theory now is just assisted suicide. <laughs> oh, that's great. Well, why do you really have to ask a sense to suicide them? Why don't you just start killing them? You know, it's really based that way. Yeah. Seriously. Yeah, honestly, they're going to go down that route. Oh, yeah, that's called abortion, really. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, right? Oh, my God. So you have a planned trip coming up, North Sentinel Island. Tell yes. us why you want to go there, what's the reason to be there, um, why people should know about North Sentinel Island. Yeah, so this will be my last ever trip when this happens, but it's going to happen maybe the uh, maybe two or three years. But when it happens, it, it will be big. It will be an international incident. And the reason is North Central Island is officially the second most dangerous island in the world, it, but it's definitely the yeah. first. So it's an island off the coast of, um, off the coast of India, mm-hmm. and it's completely inhabited by natives that have barely a contact with the outside world. They're hostile to every single outsider where they just kill them and bury them. Um, you know, if you try and create diplomatic relations, they kill them. Uh, if you try and just teach them anything, kill them. If you try and give them a gift killed, you know, they just hate outsiders. You know, it's like, um, it's like a base Republican, I guess. Um, so, I really, I really want to go there because there was a way to get around this and it's the most autistic plan ever. Because these people, these, you know, 200 or so South Sudanese individuals Mm -hmm. are stuck in the Stone Age. They don't have any tools Mm -hmm. uh, that can kill you apart from these spears and maybe a knife they've crafted. If I go in a full suit of medieval armor, like thick (laughs) plating, you know, I'm going to be like Iron Man to them. They'll just (laughs) throw a spear or like shoot an arrow or smugly, you know, like it's worked for their tens of thousands of years. It's going to bounce off me. Once again, they go, oh, and then just run into the forest. If I go 20 so people and they start charging at me, I'm just going to shoot fireworks at them, like little sparklers. <laughs> <laughs> you know, imagine you're a native. Imagine you're like a native. Gulliver's travel yeah, style. <laughs> exactly. Imagine you're a native and you've never, you know, you've never seen anything substantial. Yeah. And then suddenly uh, some guy just comes on doing that. <laughs> yeah. You got to think like this guy's a god or he's just like, yeah. you know, invincible. You're not going to mess with him. Right. Like he's shooting, he's shooting lightning out his hands. How is he doing that? <laughs> <laughs> and no one's actually filmed inside the island. So we've got an account from a British explorers who forced themselves on the islands in the mm-hmm. 1800s saying, you know, oh, it's really interesting. We've got this unique uh, architecture when it comes to um, uh, building the huts and everything. Mm-hmm. And they've got weird rituals and statues and everything. Mm-hmm. And I, I just think going in there, exploring this one bit not even just surviving but just properly goofing off and thriving yeah. <laughs> would be amazing 
So you can film all that, that'll get multi millions of views. Um, their language is unknown, so there's no language that actually fits with them. Uh, there's been some accounts of people getting natives from nearby islands mm-hmm. and, and trying to say some words to the North Sentinelese, but they just have no reaction. I think they have a similar language, but it's just so far distant that they just yeah. don't know it yet. Yeah. Um, the only way to get onto the islands uh, without them throwing arrows at you is to do a funny Fortnite dance with a coconut above your head. <laughs> so apparently that means an offering of a coconut, which is something that's so rare uh, on their island. Yeah, yeah it's not <laughs> native to the island. It doesn't grow there because they're retarded and haven't invented agriculture yet. <laughs> so if you offer them a coconut, it's like... It's like me offering you, uh, you know, Dr. Pepper in the middle of the desert. You know, it's gonna be, it's gonna be nice. Yeah. Um, so these people are actually will not shoot arrows at you if you give them coconuts, which is pretty funny. You know, it's the best trade of a lifetime. Mm-hmm. Um, and the other thing is too, the British gave these North Sentinels a bunch of gold back in the day to apologize for what they did. So I'm guessing that's somewhere, and that would just be nice to recover. You know, go back to the British Museum. <laughs> And because this island is in such, you know, myth um, infamy, I guess uh, mm-hmm. this island is so well known. Anyone who goes there has been killed, like a missionary, a few stranded uh, mm-hmm. sailors, a few fishermen by accident. Yeah, they all get killed. If I went there and exchanged a modern compound bow I bought off Amazon for say a hundred dollars for one of their traditional handmade bows, because mine is obviously superior, right? Yeah. I trade it for them. I sell that at auction for like a few thousand to a million dollars, I guarantee. Yeah, that, it's yeah, it's one of the kind. Probably yeah. more than a thousand, honestly. 100%, yeah. Yeah, exactly. I'll probably say it for a tenner, you know, starting bid. But, uh, <laughs> but it would just be reducing that super scary, dangerous island to something that's actually kind of funny and goofy. And I know you'll piss so many people off. That's kind of the whole point of it. Um, I know the Indian government will try and extradite me. It's why I'm not going to India before that. Okay. Um, <laughs> I think it's definitely worth it. Um, even if it gives me prison time, which I think it would, maybe five years, I would definitely do that for five years in prison. You'd become one of the greatest we'll- explorers of all time. Yeah. It would officially like you would be up be there stamped. with some of the conquistadors <laughs> yeah. and shit like that. Like you would officially have no choice but to put you up there. Thank you. Yeah. Well, my plan is in the long term is um I, I, I want to go down the route of you know those YouTubers who blow up and then they suddenly have millions to spare overnight somehow. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. Maybe one day I can get a ton of money and then bribe everyone in India and go, yeah, he can do that now. And we'll allow it. Yeah, Because no one's allowed we'll to go on this it. island. Yeah. Yeah, the Indian government does allow it still to extradite you from the UK to India to serve uh, 50 years in their no toilet pee pee poo poo jail, or whatever <laughs> India has. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, India's superpower by 2020. But um, <laughs> yeah. So- yeah, but like. <laughs> So go ahead, Miles. Go ahead. Finish out. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I should keep talking. <laughs> but um, I, I just, I think if I bribe the right people, I can really go to this island and they mm-hmm. can't do anything about it. That's kind of a whole point. I want to get to a point where no one can stop me. They just go, oh, it's Miles. He's just causing yeah, just international instance. <laughs> yeah, just let him do his thing. Yeah. We did have this saying in school, in university, and it was written on a board because everyone, every one of my flatmates believed it. Mm-hmm. And it was... We, we can't negotiate or reason with Miles. All we can do is encourage him. <laughs> so, you know, one thing when that goes on, all me and David are going to be thinking is at least he's not American. For once, it's not an American <laughs> going doing something, creating an issue, um, because it's always the Americans doing something, fucking it up, creating an issue. So one thing I do have to ask, because, you know, big thing with the leftist theory right now is, you know, the noble savage, right? You know, a Rousseauian Hegelian theory where, you know, the noble savage is a big deal. And they're trying to push us back into what basically you're describing with North Sentinel. They want us all to go back to dealing with sticks and stones. You know, we don't have a wheel yet. We have to make it out of wood or rock again. Like they want us to go back and not have any modern amenities unless we're up in the elite class with them. The plebes will have nothing. They'll have everything a la communist Russia. But yeah, You've had a lot of travels. You've seen a lot of places, like you said, legitimate mud huts. Now, I think us in the West, 
We've, been, we've grown up on modern amenities. Our poor have grown up on modern amenities. We don't know what poor is. You've seen legitimate poor. You've seen stick huts held up by hair being tied. Like, you oh, know, yeah. things like that with no electricity. They don't even, uh, you know, that's something they have to travel into the city for. Maybe they see a light when they go to market. Like, that's the most they get. How could these people benefit from getting fossil fuels into their lives? Because I feel like that's been push so much. And if you see, you know, you see the book, I have Alex Epstein's book, Fossil Future up here. Um, Just from your perspective, like what would it do if we could get just a a one point oh one percent of the fossil fuel usage we have in the West into some of the places that you have been? How could it change so many of these people's lives? Oh, it would massively help them. So, you know, those you know those cringe stories you always see on adverts saying this man walks twenty, this boy walks twenty miles a day to get water. Yep. Well, here's the thing: they can actually uh, fill their U-hauls with you know petrol, gas, and they can actually drive yep. to where the water is and actually live there now. So it's it's really genius. Yep. Um, <laughs> they, I don't know. They, jokes aside, they can do basic things like actually go to school. Uh, they can transport items. They can build infrastructure because you need you need petroleum and everything to build roads, right? Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. For the tarmac and everything, so you can basically build modern stuff. And if you're right wing, you'll be excellent because better living conditions in certain places means means less immigration, right? Mm-hmm. So overall, oh. you make everyone's lives a little bit happier, mm-hmm. and then you can obviously uh, you know, create a more stable society. These people would be happy. They can get mm-hmm. to modern medicine, uh, modern hospitals with the infrastructure that can be set up through petroleum and natural resources. Honestly, I, I think that's what we need. It's what's lifted out uh, billions out of poverty in China and stuff like that because, you know, they started utilizing their resources. Mm-hmm. That's why North Korea sucks for the moment because they can't process any of the goods mm-hmm. they have. Yep. Um, yeah, if you want to live like an impoverished person um, and that's what the government wants to do to us, even if even if we just have sticks and stones, I think a stick and a stone is still enough to bash in like Bill Gates is uh, skull if I need to. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I can still do that. So if it gets close stuff. enough. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So yeah, I, mean, I have a request for you. I have a request for you since you are a man of pilgrimages and I am one of those pansies that don't go and do the things that I wish I could do. You are the guy. Can you please yes, go in? to the Scandinavian countries and just prove how hard it is to become a citizen in any of them and to prove how homogenous they try to be because we're all told in the West, oh, the Scandinavian nations, they're the ones that, well, now you mean Klaus Schwab is saying China because the mask is coming off, right? But for the most part, we've been told, you know, the Scandinavian nations, they do socialism perfectly. And it's like, you look at it and it's like, ah, they lose money every year. It's minuscule, but they do. But also... It's because they're all white. It's because the Scandinavian nations are all Scandinavian. And the country, Sweden, who started, uh, not Sweden, um, yeah, I think it was Sweden, started letting in a massive amount of refugees, is now trying to kick them all out because they have screwed up the nicest that they had. So can you go on a mission to try and get citizenship into all the Scandinavian nations and kind of record how long it takes you to get this citizenship? Because I feel like as, oh, well I would love that, your, yes. as well as all your other travels, you can kind of prove that I am a white Westerner and these Scandinavian nations aren't racist by color. They just don't want anybody that's not from their nation there. They hate everybody else because in order to keep up their grift of being a socialist nation, they need to have people that have the same exact culture and think exactly like them. Can you make that? Oh, exactly. Yes. Easily. So, yeah, it'll be a multi year long video because mm-hmm. the process is so difficult from what it's, I've seen. Mm. So I, I, I've done some shopping for second citizenships, of course. Mm. And when you see this process you have to go through, it's so difficult. And even for an immigrant, you know, they, they, they can't pronounce half the words that Scandinavians use. Their language is crazy. I mean, they've got a million different things, so they're never going to integrate. They take them in just to say, oh, you know, you can work in that country, you're never going to be a citizen. Yeah. And maybe there's one or two kebab shops in the Scandinavian nations that I've seen, unfortunately. And they're not even good kebabs, so, you know, not even oh, the best I immigrants. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no. Uh, gosh, yes. But... <laughs> <laughs> But at the same time, um, you know, it's it's so good that you can't can't get easy citizenship sometimes. Never it just good. keep it just keeps all these people out. Yeah, yeah. So that's a mission that I want you to do. That's gonna be a non well, I don't know, it might be life threatening at some point if you push hard enough because they don't want people there. So before we wrap up, 
Where are the next places planned? Where can we see you risking your life in the next, uh, you know, months, weeks, years? Where's the next places planned for you to go? I've got a list and the list is about 30 places long in Ooh. priority, but I'm going to skip to the big ones in the next, uh, I think it's going to be the next year or something. And this is in, in order, but so I'm going to go to an island in Brazil that has a lot of snakes. Uh, I won't, I won't exaggerate on that one, Thanks but uh, I, yeah, it, it's, yeah, it's said to be the most dangerous island yeah. in the world. Pretty much, yeah. So uh, there's a plan with that. It might involve the suit of armor as well, which there is you go. <laughs> so snakes can't bite through. You know? Yeah, um, you don't tell the uh, the uh, Brazilian Navy anytime soon. But yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's happening after Christmas, I believe. Okay. I might go to Ukraine in about three or four days. I'll just fly to Poland, take the train into the front lines, and hang out with a few soldiers that have reached out to me. We see my chill dudes. I'll bring some beers, you know, and say, oh, you know, no, good, decent work, lads, killing people. Enjoy a cold one if you want. Yeah, why not? It's the least I can do. It's the least I can do. Could be some mm-hmm. good footage. Mm-hmm. I met up with uh, a quite famous individual today. That we unveiled in about three days. Okay. Uh, but I can't. I can't tell you who he is. But uh, he's a top G. Okay, That's you awesome. get what I mean. Uh, okay, okay. There you, go. Yes, there you go. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Real top G. Um, <laughs> Uh, what else to oh yes yeah, so uh, after that uh, that island that involves snakes that isn't all called Snake Island wink wink um, <laughs> I'll go back to Afghanistan to buy up some Taliban merch to resell but whilst I'm there <laughs> That's I'll awesome. shoot thank you I'll, I'll shoot yeah, I, I was I was interested in getting either some some stuff from you or the Hello Kitty Kabul shirts from Callum because those are oh, yeah. amazing <laughs> shirts we were walking around the market and Callum just said oh drip and I was like, oh, what is this? <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, he even did the soy face, so did I. It was great. Oh, such amazing. a good t-shirt. Yeah, apparently it was apparently it was a custom made order, uh, limited order, and they oh. just never collected on like some of it, and that was the remaining part of it. So it's wow. like limited edition as well. Oh. But I want to shoot a bazooka at a Soviet tank. Uh so I went to my guy in Afghanistan, one of my guys, and I was like, "Oh, hello, brother. How are you?" He's like, "Very good, brother. I, I want to uh, I want to shoot a bazooka at a tank." And he goes, "It could be done, brother. It'll be uh, awesome. like it would be like eight hundred dollars for uh, like the ride, the day out, uh, the guy organizing it, his payment, my payment, mm-hmm. the bazooka, uh, the tank, the tank itself, like the permits." So I'm like. Eight hundred dollars or all that? He's like, is it too much? I was like, no, I can, I can, I can do that. There'll be a million view YouTube video right there. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it'll be an old Soviet tank, so it's not going to be sadly a working one, but yeah. it could be fun. I'll see what yeah, exactly. And plus, I can still say, you know, shalom, my niggas to the Taliban. <laughs> <laughs> and then after that, there's a few places. So if you type in on Google Alert Canada, there's a research base that's right on the north of those islands on the north of Canada. You know, when you see those islands dotted on top yeah. um, of Canada, you have no idea what goes on there. Not really does. The northernmost settlement of the world is that place called Alert in Canada. And it's right on the uh, edge of there yeah, going on to the North Pole. Yeah, it's 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 middle of nowhere. There's a Tim Hortons. It's 500 miles from a real uh, of an airport. There's a Tim Hortons. It's, what the hell? Yeah, this little. It's, it's a, a military. <laughs> it's a military base. Yeah, it's a military base where um, they monitor incoming nuclear missiles from Russia if okay. they launch. Basically, so it's like an advanced okay. alert station. Yeah. Um, and I emailed the Canadian government going, oh, hi there, can I pop down? I know it's like 500 miles of uh, walking through, uh, you know, the frozen wasteland that mm-hmm. is the Arctic Circle, but I'll bring some supplies and some friends, pretty please. And he said, uh, no. And I emailed back, <laughs> I emailed back saying, but is there a fence though? And he's never emailed back. So I think it's explicit. I think he'd say explicit permission allowing me to go. <laughs> oh, I honestly, I honestly will. At some point when I, mm-hmm. I got the logistics down, it's just funding of the long term. Mm-hmm. And as a, there's one of a headless valley in Canada. If if you don't know about that, mm-hmm. about 20 people have died, been decapitated mysteriously, apparently Ooh. by an uncontacted tribe. Because if you've entered this, uh, this valley, that's really hard to get into, uh, you know, these people haven't been contacted. They'll just execute any foreigners. Uh, there's a really good video on it online. Okay. Um, you just type in headless valley on YouTube. And then there's other places I want to go to. Um, like, I want to go to South Central Island, next to North Central Island. It's about mm-hmm. 20 miles away. 
And it's a little bit smaller. You can just chill on there. So I just want to laugh as the North Sense leaves, get into their mindset, you know? Yeah. yeah. There you go. Yeah, exactly. A little prep yeah. work. Exactly. And um, do you guys know uh, what, uh, I can't pronounce his name, uh, what a Voltist history? Like the, uh, no, I think uh, he's, he's a history YouTuber and he makes like, um, he makes like hour long videos talking about history and stuff. He, mm-hmm. He's gone quite big because okay. you're a history major, mate. So I think, look uh, him up. yeah. Uh, what was it? What if all list? I can't say it ever. What if? Yeah. What, what if all list? I think if you saw one of his videos, you might recognize it. Okay. But he's, co- he's coming with me on a trip. Uh, he's nice. a big YouTuber. You you would honestly love him. He came um, up, so. He yeah, this it is. Yeah. Cool. What if all? Yeah. Okay. We'll, we'll, no- David will send it. We'll, we'll do our research on him. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. He's a good man, honestly. Um, so there's a, there's a trip between, there's a border between Afghanistan and China, which most people don't know about. Mm-hmm. No one's crossed it since 1947. One photo exists of it. So I'm going to put a team together of five people, which I've got so far. We're going to hike about 100 miles each way. Um, plot a little flag on top of this border, which is like 4,700 feet up. So it's really high up border. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and apparently it's an ISIS smuggling route too, so we're going to have to be armed. So we're going to have to buy weapons in Afghanistan and then just drive, you know, 500 miles to this area. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just going to be a really fun trip. I don't know. I think we're just going to cause an international incident. Yeah. So that, you know, I guess that sums up this podcast. That sums up Lord Miles. Yeah. Let's go cause international incidents. And the next time you see you know your leftist media putting something up or even some conservative media international incident look for lord miles or crazy british tourists <laughs> up there depending <laughs> on which side you're getting it from because more than likely he will be the one causing it miles really appreciate you coming on the show yeah, this was great lots of fun dude thank you man i do appreciate it i like being the sam hyde of travel you know <laughs> <laughs> just a little bit crazy you gotta and, challenge uh, hassan to a boxing match now <laughs> you do yeah you, you here's the thing you could actually go find hassan and you're the one you're the guy that can actually go do it sam hyde just won't because he no he will i'm not gonna say he won't but i don't think he's like wants to wanting to do that you just won't get like sued, a person that yeah. will like you're not afraid of that you're like i take on governments i'll take on you so yeah that's gonna be your new goal you should find hassan everywhere he goes and just like airdrop his location to sam uh, <laughs> but, but again he's lord miles rutledge he is at this point just a renowned world traveler goes into the most dangerous places that you can think of and a bunch that you don't even know of mm-hmm. and just goes in there talks to the people as if they're people experiences the danger that you only dream of and is still here kicking for now so uh it was such a good time having you dave do you have anything else do you want to say before we close out no, nah, this has been incredible. I I thoroughly enjoy hearing it from the horse's mouth himself. <laughs> like I I have fought, since the Kabul stuff like popped off, and I found out about what was going on with you there. I've been following you at least slightly every so often, just popping back Thank in. You. Like, okay, he's doing this now. Okay, he's like homeless <laughs> in New York City for a week for some reason. That's interesting. <laughs> like, it, you're you're going and you're just taking on these challenges, and I love witnessing it happen, especially because. Like Alex said, like a lot of us don't do it for whatever reason. Uh, and you do, whether you think that's retardation or just courage, doesn't matter. It's a lot of it's a lot of fun to just see that happen and see someone out just go and live life because that doesn't happen a lot these days. So it's it's enjoying to witness. Thank you. Live, love, laugh. So true. <laughs> <laughs> live, love, laugh. Oh, my God. You are a walking epitome of live, love, laugh with an AK-47 <laughs> yeah. in your arms. Um, again, Thank you so much for coming on. This was the Alex Cuesta show. That's Lord Miles Routledge. Um, I really appreciate you jumping on the show. Anyone that enjoyed it, please go give us a like, share, follow, subscribe, rate five stars. Spread this word of mouth. Find us on social media at the Alex Cuesta show. Hope you enjoyed this special Sunday edition. Everybody, so long.